Gifted Talks fundraising offers you a seat at the table for a relaxed chat about what it takes to build successful giving programs. Marshalling decades of practical hands-on experience, the Gifted Directors share how they're addressing current challenges, providing helpful insights and top tips for achieving your fundraising targets. Welcome back to One Mill Street again, guys. Um, it's amazing uh, uh, how these conversations come together, and I'm just so pleased today we're going to get an opportunity to talk about um, the whole question of schools, bursaries, uh, and how they're funded, and what's appropriate in independent schools uh, to do that. And with me today, obviously, is Amy Stevens, all the way from Leeds. Thank you, Amy, for travelling down the M1. Good to see and you. And Chris Goldie up the M40 from, from London back to the centre of the universe here in Leamington Spa. So good to see you both guys. Good and to be um, here. it's always good to catch up for a coffee. I think too, these conversations have been really helpful for me just learning from what you're learning out there. I mean, as fundraising consultants, we get really right into it with our clients, don't we? We walk mm -hmm. the walk with them and really, in, it's quite a fast changing subject, this one at the moment. A lot, lot of things happening at government levels and so on. Um, and given our work with the surveys, the gifted work we're doing with um, IDPE, We've got some really strong relationships here, so we're hopeful today we can bring that and, and share our, uh, our distilled wisdom here. Um, Chris, can I come to you first? Can you just describe what's going on out there? What are bursaries uh, and how, how, who are our independent schools? Can you set the scene for us? Okay, so we have this curious system in this country, don't we, of calling our independent schools public schools, which has always really confused the yeah. world. Yeah. Um, but they are essentially private schools, and as we know, they are... Uh, currently the, the subject of quite hot debate politically around should they be charities, should VAT be charged on fees, etc., etc. But we're not here to talk about the politics. Yeah. We're here to talk about what independence schools do in terms of support for talented young people mm. who uh, will thrive better more often in a private school setting where they're likely to have smaller classes, uh, certainly better facilities, in the main, not necessarily always better teachers, mm -hmm. um, but certainly smaller classes, better facilities, and maybe a bit more of a focus on their particular strengths. Be so, they so they do, they, you can have these independent schools that are not just, you know, Eaton, Harrow, whatever. It, it can be a school that's focused on, you know, special needs, for example, or a, or, a, or a school that's got a particular strength in the arts or in sports. Or is that that's, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the fact is the independent school sector covers pretty much everything that exists out there in society. Mm. I think what the public sees are the grand old private schools, the Eatons and the Harrows and the Winchesters and the Cheltenham Ladies Colleges and, you know, uh, but that's, that is, you know, a that's thumbnail's just, worth of schools. Yeah. The vast majority of independent schools are local. Yeah. Uh, they are hardworking families who send their kids there. This is not the TOFs. This is not the, 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 you know, the, the wealthiest people in the country. We say to all of our clients, you know, when you come to fundraising, probably 60% of your parents aren't going to give at all because um, they're spending all of their spare money on the school fees. Yeah, fair point. So I think it's really important to understand that what independent schools is deliver, aspire to deliver a really consistent quality of education a broader curriculum of interests that hopefully will end up with uh, young people coming out after A-levels as good, rounded, grounded characters. Ooh, rounded, and most rounded. schools... Rounded and grounded. Rounded and grounded. And, grounded. and if you ask most schools that we work with mm -hmm. what their ambitions are for the kids, it's not you know X number of scholarships to Oxbridge or Princeton or Harvard or wherever it might be. It is actually what we want to produce are good young citizens of the future. Thank you. So, and Amy, we, I mean, the history of funding of independent schools, um, private schools, uh, some, some of which are public schools, um, has been quite interesting across the UK, hasn't it? I mean, mm. this is where before the, they were there before the state started, you know, providing education services. And so this, this is very much a, a local response, very often funded by philanthropy. Like, so that's the interesting thing. Most work, do have a history of philanthropy, don't they? Which yeah. is why it's so 
important that it continues and those bursaries kind of come full circle again. Yeah. And we've seen over the years, governments sort of step in mm-hmm. and, and, you know, obviously there have been grammar schools ultimately to try and drive that academic outcome. But then with the politics against the grammar schools, some of those have fallen away. And we saw, didn't we not, direct grant direct and, then, and then sort of assisted places. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what's, what's that done, Chris, as far as the scene now as to giving how are how are what's the scene you've done a lot of work on the surveys H- how are our independent schools you know fundraising where are they seeing success and most particularly where's the bursary offer and could you talk a little bit about what a bursary is today okay well let's start with what a bursary is a bursary is financial support for a student and therefore the family of a student mm. that is not based necessarily on their academic ability or their sporting ability it's not a scholarship mm-hmm. historically independent schools used to award scholarships based on academic merit and that would give a slight discount on the school fees what a bursary is it's aimed it's much more means tested right. and it provides financial support at different levels so, so the, par- the parents or the family would sit down and, and report on what their income yeah and then based on that, there'd be an assessment made on Absolutely. What, what, do, what level. So you might get a 10% subsidy or more. Um, yeah, well, different schools would have different policies okay. and based really around how much money they've got to give away. Um, some schools uh, will have significant endowments that will go back centuries. So Christ Hospital, for example, is always held up as being the school that gives away the most in bursary funds. And it does, uh-huh. but it has historic endowments that enables it to do so other schools do not have that level of endowment ironically (laughs) some schools are called endowed schools and have no endowment at all which is a really (laughs) odd but they were once endowed going back to the point that amy just made they were once endowed by an individual locally who said i'm going to create a school for 20 it would have been boys in those days local boys to have a an education and that's so if you go into a cotswold town you'll find an old schoolhouse yeah yeah. yeah, you know, it's that sort of thing. But that, that's expanded now. So a, a, a bursary in the conventional sense is generally paid for out of a school's operational income. OK. And a certain amount of money is set aside every year to provide a discount anywhere between 10 and, say, 80, 90 percent on school fees. Hmm. The trend in recent years, and this is why schools are doing more and more fundraising, is to try and offer more significant, substantial bursaries so that actually the kids who get them are not kids from nice middle-class families who already earn a reasonable and, thing and what, but they're, they're, they're kids from nice working-class families who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to go to that school and amy what what do you think the benefits are for that what how does that change a school if it's got you know a much more diverse intake i think that's some of the feedback we get isn't it from donors to, to bursary funds from other parents mm. saying you know i want my child to grow up in an environment where all aspects of community are covered or cultures or backgrounds and that brings that key benefit of you know that well-rounded child that doesn't live in a bubble Mm. that does understand others and and how they live and Mm. and what their lives look Mm. like um it's a major benefit as children so, so grow there's, up, isn't there's, it? there's a win-win there there's a win in having the, the bursary child come in and get a get a hopefully a, a more focused or better education um get more opportunity certainly as well as to those who are paying the full fee mm-hmm. um the parents can be said right well actually your child's going to be you know ready for the world when they graduate from this school it's not they're not going to be coming out with a silver spoon or in, yeah. in such a bubble and i think that's you know, i think a lot of the the reputation that independent schools have from the general public is based around their very limited knowledge of what they see mm-hmm. and so without pinpointing any particular individuals those who are very prominent in public life very often are associated with private schools and if we don't like them we therefore say the private school itself you see, could, you now, could... an, an interesting fact you know boris johnson went to eton college so did the guy who founded greenpeace yeah and I, you know, I mean, yeah. it, this, 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 this is the dynamic of, of, of private schools. I went to a great <laughs> private school, you know, in London. And look what, look what it turned out. And look out. what it turned out. <laughs> yeah. But I went to a great private school in London, but at a time in the 70s when there were no bursary students apart. There were scholars, but yeah. there were no bursary students. So we were in that sort of bubble. Mm. Now, we at least were in London. We were predominantly a day school, so maybe we were a little bit more grounded than had we been at a a boarding school out in the country. But nevertheless, we were undoubtedly privileged. Now that school 
raises significant amounts of money every year to support what is the trend, which is transformational bursaries, which is what schools want to do. Okay, let's, let's talk a bit more about that. We've got school fees for independent schools ranging from a few thousand to tens of thousands every year. Um, if you think about that, uh, to be paid out of after-tax income means that you know you can be earning six figures as a salary and still not be able to afford to send your children to an independent school. Um, so we're, you know, that's really pushing the middle class in a place, you know, and, and if you make education a priority for your, ch as your family spend rather than second cars or mm. holiday houses or whatever else, uh, you might be able to squeeze the pips. But a transformational bursary, so is, is quite something that is, correct me if I'm wrong, 100% school fees being covered? Yeah, or even 110%, or 100% or plus some money on top. What's that, what, why, why? Because it recognises that not only do you cover the school fees, but there are incidental costs associated to going to a school. So whether that's oh. sports kit, whether that's okay. a, a school trip. Laptops, you know, laptops things like that, computer, yeah. You know, whatever it might be. And it recognises that if you're going to award 100% bursary, that bursary has to go to somebody who comes from the most humble of origins. Right. So, you know, the it's uh, not it's, middle class welfare. This is not middle about. class welfare. This right. is a child with natural ability, be that academic or sporty mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. cases or cultural music, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. who otherwise would never get to a school that can offer them what they need. Right. Right. So what you're genuinely doing is taking somebody from you know, you're transforming somebody's life by taking them out of an environment where they will be one of a very large number of people at a big state secondary school mm -hmm. and giving them an opportunity. And, and here, let's remember their purpose might be that they have special needs well, uh, or that they have a special absolutely. gift in sport or music absolutely. or drama or something. Yeah. That's where the independent school But focuses. you're also recognising, this, yeah. this is where the additional piece comes in, yeah. that it would not be fair for that child to go to school every day and then not be able to go on the school trip with all of his or her classmates yeah, because the family can't afford it. Or it's yeah. not fair that with the uniform changes or the sports gear changes that that child doesn't have the same opportunity. So that's where I think it's now been recognised by schools that if you're going to give 100% bursaries, you actually have to give 100% and a little bit more. There is a foundation that focuses on this, isn't there, called is it Springboard Foundation? Yeah, so you've got so Springboard, it, it was actually rugby school and... <laughs> Uh, the head of rugby school in the about 20 odd years ago by the name of Patrick Derham, mm -hmm. who ironically was my neighbour in my first year at university in, in our university halls of residence. <laughs> um, and Patrick had been to Pangbourne mm -hmm. and had been to Pangbourne with financial support mm -hmm. and it transformed his life. And, mm -hmm. and he was very much instrumental in setting up the Arnold Foundation at Rugby School, which right. was very much around bursaries. And then the Springboard Foundation had run up in parallel and the two sort of come together. Okay. Uh, the Springboard Foundation raises money and works with schools and a number of different schools to provide bursaries for people in a slightly different format. I think what a lot of schools now recognise is that they can do this themselves. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And they can do it because there is an increasing number of people, both alumni and parents, who recognise the value of supporting bursaries. And that's why in the current, what we found out in the IDP survey in 2022, is that somewhere in the region of 85% of independent schools are raising money for bursaries currently. Yeah. Don't rising. you think the, the transformational bursary gives us a really good opportunity to demonstrate impact as well, rather mm. than those, you know, part funded, we'll, mm. we'll give you 10%, because... Mm. Like you say, Chris, it's it's a child that never would have that experience yeah, and, and that opportunity, it's, isn't it? It's a really important motivator, and we know that we've been lucky enough as gifted to work with a lot of schools. Very often, we're asked by schools to look at should we be raising money for bursaries or should we be raising money for a capital bill? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and we've helped schools. Do I can both. think of about four yeah. or five. Yeah. Either they've done both, or actually, it's why do you start doing this? Your first campaign. Build the culture of fundraising around, say, bursaries, and yeah. then you'll be ready for a big capital yeah, campaign when true. you need it. Why? Because bursaries are current. They're relevant. You can always find kids Definitely out there from the community who deserve the education that you can offer. It motivates people. And it motiv and the other beauty of it is, of course, it, it, it satisfies both the immediacy of the impact that, that a major donor might want. In mm. other words, I could fund somebody every year for six, seven years, mm get the tax benefit every year the school gets a commitment and i know that child is going to be funded you, you, or at lower level to your broad community of schools and schools have in a very fortunate position it could be very simple to so say you can help us build for the future 
yeah. by giving a modest amount. So, you know, I give fifteen pounds and nine P because fifteen oh nine was the year that my school was founded yeah. a month yeah. to yeah. a bursary fund. Yeah. I'm not expecting impact reports from individuals, no, no. but what I want to know is that by a certain time, my school will be giving X number of transformational bursaries. But it's interesting, and and I'll come to you on this, Amy. I mean, the, the history, if you like, of funding into what are now independent schools has been building, if you like, a pool of potential support amongst alumni or old boys and girls mm. because because of the fact so many of them were supported by, by grants or by assisted places, as they were, and and they they rec- they benefited if you like th- because of that support Absolutely. by getting that education. Yeah, I saw that in a, a independent school I worked with in Yorkshire, and a lot of the major donors had been on direct grants. Right. Um, and you know they were saying it's my duty to give back. Yeah. I wouldn't be where I am today That's had I not had that opportunity. Those magic words. And yeah. therefore. For me to be able to give that to another child is is so powerful for them. Yeah. Mm. And even if they didn't go to that school, they, they may have gone to a grammar school because yes. they were they're of an age where grammar schools existed. When you work with grammar schools now, and you speak to the oldest alumni, they of course went to a grammar school because they came from very humble origins. Correct. And they would have passed. And if they've gone on to be time. successful, yeah. mm. they really look back and they say, if, if you know, if I hadn't gone to that grammar school. I would not have got to where I am today. Yeah. These days, as we know in the grammar school sector, it's, you know, parents very often will send their kids to private school until the age of 11 mm. to make sure they get through mm. 11 plus because they'll take advantage of having a really good grammar school in the area. And that's yeah. great. And they will support that grammar school. So parents are great in terms of supporting capital projects. Obviously, grammar schools don't worry about bursaries, but supporting capital projects because they know that they've, they've got they've, opportunity. But the, let's not underestimate the importance, as Amy says, of you know what the personal experience, yeah. either at your own school or as I've got in the case of one of my current clients, you know, a very wealthy parent yeah. who himself went to a grammar school in another part of the country, who now recognises the importance the of. Mm. of but you, you, were, you were saying, Chris, and again, Amy, please come in. I, the the parents themselves are probably not the most likely source for philanthropic giving at independent schools at the moment. It, I mean. I think you said 60% won't be there. Um, but certainly around bursaries, the, the pivot must therefore be to alumni. And and to your point about those people having benefited from assisted mm. places and grants, grant grant schemes, is that is that what you're seeing? I mean, are they the ones that you would naturally turn to around a bursaries program? For me, that's, that's the first port of call. Mm. But as we've talked about in, in other conversations, that's where your feasibility study comes in to yeah. speak to you. So that you want their names on, that, on your interview Absolutely. list, your feasibility yeah. study. You to, want to test that to, mix, to, to don't see. you, and see. And do they try and focus some of these bursaries? I mean, and I'm conscious about some of the recognition. You know, if you wanted to fund, if I was an alumni, as I am of a particular, if I wanted to fund a particular, you know, let's say, cricket scholarship bursary or someone who was interested in dare I say politics or history or something I mean is that is that more and more the case or is it are schools resisting the designation if you like of bursary funding I think it depends slightly on the outlook and nature of the school itself mm. right if a school has a particular interest in sport for example mm. mm-hmm. then it will probably be more open to a bursary funding and we see in cricket there's a lot yeah. of criticism of the England cricket team being mostly kids who went to independent schools that is true but actually at least 50 if not 60 percent of those England cricketers went to a school on a bursary at a certain point so okay. people talk about Joe Root went to private school well Joe right. Root only went to private school when he was 16 yeah. Yeah. for the oh, last absolutely. two years of his career on a scholarship before that he'd gone to the state secondary school in Sheffield where he grew up yeah. so I think we've got to be very aware of that now of course what is happening in that sport and rugby and other sports it's happening younger and younger mm. and it's almost replaced the university I'm, I'm, sector I'm just thinking in Yorkshire you'd certainly get a, a bit of scholarship uh, bursary funding for cricket or for dare I say <laughs> but, the Headingley scholarship I don't know <laughs> it's a niche thing and I think as with as as with any client in any sphere if a, if a, if a major donor comes along and says I'm going to give you X to do Y mm. then as a school or an institution you'll decide whether probably Y is something you want it. to do yeah. but the chances are you'll probably take and, it and what of you I mean do you think that it's right therefore that the school reports back on how young Andrew's doing if 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 you know to the donor if they've been mm. funding it's challenging isn't it because obviously you can't name a specific child and say this is who you're funding and what have you but 
that impact reporting is vital. Yeah. You know, the donor wants to know that the child they're funding is succeeding and enjoying life and yeah. progressing. And their money's making a difference. They're, Absolutely. They're, they're, yeah, yeah. so there's got to be a level of reporting whether that's anonymized or not yeah and how that's managed is a good question an ethical question yeah, no, what I think, seen, Chris? well so i think i think those who run schools very naturally think we can't talk about it's unfair to identify yeah. bursary students mm. i think there's that and, and they're right within the, the life the school life of a child mm. you don't want certain people sort of you know with a badge on them going yeah i'm a bursary student yeah but that is very different from an individual donor who may be funding a mm -hmm. specific child's education right. and having a sort of little closed environment whereby the student, who knows they're a bursary student, mm. also understands that one person is paying for it. Mm. Now, you have to trust on both sides that the, the donor isn't going to go, oh, and I fund yeah. little Freddie over here. Yeah. Perfectly good for the donor to say, I fund a bursary. Yeah, In yeah. fact, you want the, you want you want the donor to say, yeah. I fund a bursary to encourage, encourage others to do it. Mm. But, and equally, as Amy says, there's no harm in, 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 in a little thank you note, an impact. So this Fred, is what Fred, the child... Freddie does a Christmas yeah, card back. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Freddie just scored 100. Freddie's got a scholarship to Harvard. Yeah. Whatever it might be, yeah. that's great because that is a sense of satisfaction. But you know what? I think more than anything else, what is motivating an alumnus donor mm. in particular is they recognise the opportunity they had and what they were given at the school, which would have been a very different place mm. to what it is now, mm. And they want a child to benefit from that. Yeah. As more schools have gone co-ed, obviously there's more interest in you know from from, from successful women going actually you know, I'm going to make it female specific. You don't tend to get it the other way around. I was going to ask you about that, Chris. So we've done work with girls' schools, boys' schools, and co-ed, haven't we? How is it more challenging? Do you think you know funding a best funding a bursary program for girls' schools and boys? What what have we seen over the yeah. last couple yeah. of years? Where's where's the Centre of gravity. Uh, it's a very good point. So, as so, there are various rules of thumb that I think we discovered as a result of the survey. So, you know, the majority of your alumni donors are aged over fifty-five, yeah. mm. and at schools that are now co-ed that used to be single-sex boys' schools, mm. the vast majority of it is probably seventy-two percent or something are male. Wow. So you know when you're going into a study and you're doing your interview list, who do we want to speak to? We want to speak to, we want to, speak alumni, to over alumni over fifty-five and male. Equally, we know from our work with girls' schools that girls' schools have been less successful with their ongoing relationship and engagement with alumni, yeah. not least because alumni change names, female alumni more likely to change hard. names. And historically, the oldest alumni are those who are more inclined to remain in touch because they'll get together and have tea every year on the lawn and with, their, with the oldest generation. You know, I've, there are a couple of schools who literally have a function every year that is absolutely that older generation. Yeah. Um, but they're not going to give. Yeah. They might leave a legacy, so you yeah. want to remain in good touch with them, but they're not going to give, not least because the school's changed. When mm. they were at the school, mm. the school was probably a more, for want of a better expression, feminine environment. Well, there was certain elements of a finishing school, the, the, etiquette, the etiquette, and they're yeah. preparing women for a different role yeah. than they are today. Whereas yeah. parents... At yeah. girls' schools are ambitious for their daughters in the way they maybe wouldn't have been 50 years ago, and therefore yeah. they want to invest but, in facilities that are going to help there their is ambition. Though, with, you know, we've been talking about this for a couple of decades now. I mean, the girls' schools have changed, yeah. and there have been some really successful, high powered women go out there into the corporate world, make a shed load of money. Mm. And, and the challenge for the girls' schools is to get as progressive in their asking and engagement of those alumni and maybe it's around bursaries maybe that's the very thing that might just unlock that that feminine philanthropic power Absolutely. that is there that is just not really i'm not seeing one or two exceptions of course but i'm not seeing it in the girls schools well it ties back in andrew doesn't it to what we said about a younger generation being more interested in the environment social it's mobility social true. welfare yeah. successful women yeah Aged between 40 and 55 are yeah. probably far more likely mm. to want to support that sort of cause mm. than they would be the building of a new performing arts center or the building now there are certain things in girls schools stem buildings yeah that's mm. really important because mm. there is recognized there is a lack of under investment over under has been under investment over, over the yeah. years Quite. and parents in particular have ambitions for their daughters and therefore they see STEM as being really important. So de depending on which, whether it's co-ed, single sex, male, female, whatever, you really need to think carefully about who you're 
potential audience or pot donor pool might be for a bursary program in your study's yeah. got to be the place to, to well i was just going to say is it is it part of the planning then if it's a girls school bursary campaign is mm. it the mix is it targeting those you know slightly younger women who've done incredibly well mm. plus a legacy program to build an endowment rather than those so cash that, gifts now so that concept of a planned giving program yeah. they give like chris is doing to his school so much a month but then balloon at the end with, mm. with some sort of commitment yeah. in a legacy. I think they're, 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 you're absolutely right. I think that see one of the beauties of bursary fundraising is it can apply equally successfully at annual fundraising. In other words, that that regular lower yeah. level giving as it can to a capital campaign. Mm. And I think what we're starting to see more and more of, and what we recommend now to a lot of our clients is, let's say you say you know we want to raise five million pounds for bursaries. Yeah. We'll actually split that target. Yeah. Split that between, say, you know, a million and a half or two that you can start spending pretty much straight away. In other words, yeah. you, an individual donor says, I'm going to pay for a sixth form. Yeah. So let's say that's £50,000 worth of funding. You can go out and find a sixth form student mm -hmm. that can start the following year. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got your two. Immediate impact. At the same time, you know, by a certain date, we want to have this amount in an endowment, yeah. which means that on an average 5%, which is what most people will calculate on, we will be able to give away... X that we'll be able to fund X number of transformational bursaries. Yeah. That means you could continue fundraising. Your legacies will occasionally come and drop brilliantly mm. because you've mm. got a proactive legacy campaign. Mm. And suddenly that target, and then everybody, it's, 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 it's almost like there's something for everybody in that. Mm. I, I guess if you're raising philanthropic income for your bursary program, it enables you to fine tune the overall package in a different way because you've been funding certain elements in the school of bursaries anyway you get 10 transformational bursaries let's say so you can now refocus the balance of the income the, the income you've got now in a different way can't you, you can just yeah. exam look at the whole package particularly from your endowment funds where you're generally speaking you've got lots of lower level donors exactly. and the old legacy yeah. that's very different from the impact that you need to be able to give a major donor who's committed themselves to twenty five thousand mm. pounds a year gotcha you need to be able to give them something very tangible whereas actually the lower level i don't expect to get individual reports as a 15 pounds a month donor mm. on bursaries i just want to know that in 10 years time the school's giving 150 completely yeah. transformational bursaries and every school's unique aren't they so it's going to be very different for each one how yeah. they deliver that yeah. and how they manage it and they are of their place they the schools are rooted physically in the place mm. that, and and the community that they serve and and so that's also reflected both in the school's history and its giving history as well mm. but again that also reflects on bursaries takes us all the way back to the heritage yeah one of the questions that we will often ask in a study and remember we also tend to do the online surveys now to get a bit of you know, quantitative support around okay. certain concepts. Yeah. Um, is you know how how local should recipients of bursaries be? Okay. And really interestingly, particularly in 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 places, towns where there is a school that's been there for a very long time and has been, you know, part of the establishment of the town, it may not be seen to be, you know, a great British public school. It's seen to be a very good local school. Mm. Um, there it is very clear the evidence is very clear people want support for local kids why because very often that if you're a parent your child goes and plays football or rugby on a sunday morning yeah and his best friend might be at the local comprehensive school yeah yeah, yeah. and it wouldn't be good if they had the opportunity and to, wouldn't it be yeah. great if they had the opportunity to, to to go to that school so therefore and of course what that then does mm. is it also starts to take you beyond just the community of your parents and your alumni mm. but it may even take you into the territory of some local businesses particularly in a, in, in a sort of market town environment mm. and actually because you're you're genuinely supporting local people mm. all right go on amy i was going to say that was definitely um a thing in manchester with a school project i did there local businesses were really keen yeah. to hear a bit more about it which is was interesting and again local grant makers because as we know you know if you if you're doing a capital project at an independent private school the reality is it's very unlikely that any grant maker yeah, can fund exactly. it. There are some schools out there, um, in particular parts of the country, the North West is a good example, where there are some very well endowed local charities who will fund yeah. bursaries and have been funding bursaries mm. for a long time, mm. but for local kids to go to the local private school. Mm. It's interesting, and I know it's probably a subject for another one of our conversations, but what you've reminded me both today is that our... Um, if you like, our state-funded schools have forgotten that they, in many cases, were independent schools at the beginning. And I, I reflect in my own village where we've got a, a, a primary school. It's been there 
and I, and hanging up in the church is in the church tower is the list of the names of the local people that funded the establishment of that school mm. that it was a local response to the need to educate our children but long before government got involved in funding and we see that in some of the state schools we're doing work with now that actually the bis local businesses will respond mm. to capital appeals force and in really significant ways and that's a great headroom but that i think is another another debate mm. the bursary one though chris is going to be be quite interested to see how things evolve over the coming year because we've got cost of living crisis hitting capacity for the squeezed middle class if i could describe them that way us that way um but equally we've got changes in government's uh, approach and engagement of independent schools that we're likely to see um with the vat question and so on so it's is that going to change the case do you think in some ways or not is it going to change the case uh, i think some schools are grappling now with should they be offering in effect to cover the VAT costs through bursaries? In other words, they don't want to lose kids and if there are kids already in the system, mm. should they be considering using their pool of funding, their pool of money to make sure those kids have can, can complete their education? I think personally, I, whilst I understand why they want to do that, I think that's fraught with difficulties and from it a fundraising perspective. It the charitable element, doesn't it? Uh, and I think it also, it, does, it, yeah. it appeals less to your donors, yeah, yeah. if absolutely. I'm being honest. Yeah. Absolutely. The win... The positive that's come out of the last you know, year's worth of communications from potential future government is that they're not at this stage going to remove charitable status. No. So that does at least mean that schools will continue to be able to fundraise tax effectively. I think that would be legally actually very difficult well, to achieve. But that, that's, mm. And that probably is why they've decided mm. on advice that they're not going to yeah. go they down spend that all particular time path. On that. Yeah. So, so schools will be able to fundraise Schools have been working, independent schools have been working very hard to prove their public benefit mm -hmm. over the last number of years, often unrecognised. If you read the annual report of most independent schools, you'll see the range of what they do. Yeah. It obviously never gets reported in the press, but actually the schools know they're doing a good job. But I do think that bursaries, and particularly transformational bursaries, will give schools the opportunity to say, we do serve the community. It's, it's, an, uh, it's a really hot topic at the moment. I mean, I guess we're going to come together and talk again uh, around this but yeah. if i could draw our uh, session to a close just now thanks for coming in for today's uh, conversation and i uh, hope our listeners have found this helpful watch this space we'd love to hear your views um but i think uh, let's be be honest this is touching a lot of people's lives bursaries and the opportunity that this sort of philanthropy has is going to be really genuinely transformational yeah and i'll just add andrew the final piece for to all of our schools out there don't be scared of what's down the line Get on doing what you do and do it properly. Very good. F f famous final words from Chris. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Chris. Good to see you again today. Cheers. Thanks for pulling up a chair and joining our conversation today. Please share any comments or even pose a question for future episodes by emailing us at inquiries at giftedphilanthropy.com. Mm -hmm.